is Jana Adams. Welcome to today's symposium, September 26, 2020. This is the second annual medical cannabis symposium for pediatric neurological conditions. Americans for Safe Access, or ASA, and the local Sonoma chapter of ASA have teamed up to host this event. ASA is the largest national member-based organization of patients, medical professionals, scientists, and advocates for safe and legal access to cannabis for use and research. Last year, the event was held in person and only available in Sonoma County in Northern California. Due to the current situation, no large in-person events are taking place, but it has given us the opportunity to reach so many more people. This year, we have invited supporters to watch the symposium across every state in the nation, and it is available for free due to our generous sponsors. Taking the event online has given many more people access to learn about the benefits of cannabis for pediatric use from the experts. When my daughter Brooke was supposed to be starting kindergarten in 2018, her school district said that they couldn't allow cannabis on campus. I couldn't send her to school without it, as it was the only medication that was stopping her seizures. We had no choice but to advocate for her and her cannabis medication. It has been two years since we received the judge's ruling that allowed my daughter Brooke to attend a California public school with her cannabis medicine. This annual event began last year after I became a member of our local chapter ASA and met Sarah Schrader, our chapter president. She shared my passion about providing education to parents and caregivers so they could help other families find the answers about using cannabis to treat their children with serious medical conditions. This event is filled with many of the experts I learned from when researching cannabis for my daughter Brooke. Just a little more background on our story. My daughter Brooke has Dravet syndrome. She started having seizures at three months old. Dravet is a life-threatening seizure disorder that is very hard to treat as most pharmaceuticals, even taking four at a time, have not helped my daughter or been able to stop her status seizures quickly. After seeing her suffer so many times with status seizures that lasted an hour to as long as three hours, we were desperate to find something that would stop them. Even while in the ER with an IV pumping different types of drugs to try to stop the seizures, they were hard to stop. Recovery from these long trips would be days long after we left the hospital and every five weeks we would be back in the ER for another seizure that wouldn't stop. We searched for something else that could help save our daughter and started looking for something less traditional. That is when I was lucky enough to meet Jason David in 2014, who introduced me to cannabis for Brooke. His son Jaden also has Dravet. Jason had started treating his son with cannabis and seeing good results. He started sharing his knowledge and offered an event for other parents, just like me, to learn about cannabis. He brought together the people who taught him, scientists, doctors, and others who gave him the courage to try cannabis for his son. Amazingly, we found cannabis to stop Brooke's status seizures within three to four minutes with just a few drops into her gums. Now, five years later, after using cannabis, I'm happy to share with you that August 2016 was her last status seizure that required her to go to the ER. Brooke has been through so much. We had to call for an ambulance often and transport her to the ER. Now with cannabis, we are able to treat her seizures at home and know that they will stop in minutes. It has been life-changing for my daughter and our family. I can never repay Jason for the information he shared that day with us and I'm forever grateful to him for helping me find cannabis for Brooke. I hope to continue his efforts and share our experience to help others too. This is why I advocate for learning about medical cannabis and support today's event. Today's event, there will be four panels and some patient testimonials during the symposium. Each panel will conclude with a live Q&A with the speakers from that panel. Please ask your questions either in the chat box or submit your anonymous questions through the Q&A button at the bottom. We hope to get through all the questions. You should have received a program and refer to it for times and participants in the panel. This event will be recorded in case you miss anything or want to share it with others. 
It will be available online at the ASA website under the ASA Live tab. There will also be resource links for additional information on the speakers and other helpful websites. Again, we want to thank our sponsors and our speakers for making today happen. And with that, let's get started with our first panel. Hello everyone, thank you Jana. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, hello, my name is Debbie Churga. I am the Executive Director of ASA. Thank you all for joining us today. We are very excited to host this event for you. We have an amazing lineup of speakers and a great program filled with presentations from doctors, researchers, lawyers, patients, caregivers, and supporters. Um, as a reminder, you can download the full agenda at safeaccessnow.org slash neuro20 underscore program. Um, because we want this to be an interactive experience, we have left time after each panel for Q&A. So during each presentation, please feel free to add questions to the chat box or you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen um, to ask questions private privately, as Jana had mentioned. Uh, we will try to get to as many questions as possible today. I would like to one more time thank our sponsors um, at Ease, Canasafe, BASA, Caniatrics, and RISE. We honestly could not continue to do the work that we do and offer free events like the one we have today without the generous support of our sponsors. It has been a really tough year for all of us, and we are so grateful to our sponsors, donors, and supporters for continuing to support safe access and to continue to support us through this difficult time. If you are interested in sponsoring one of our events, please contact renal at safeaccessnow.org for information on upcoming events. As always, we have a lot going on that we're working on to finish up 2020 strong and to start 2020 with a bang. Um, and please stay at the end of today's um, symposium after Steph Shear's closing remarks for an exciting announcement from Ease. To begin the day, uh, our first two speakers are legends in the medical cannabis field, and we are so honored to have them present for you. Uh, first, we will hear from Dr. Sulak, followed by Dr. Goldstein. At the end of both their presentations, we have left ample time for questions, so please feel free to send um, in your questions during their presentations and we will get to them at the end. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Sulak. Um, Dr. Sulak is an integrative osteopathic physician and leader in the emerging field of cannabinoid medicine. His clinical practices practice focuses on treating refractory conditions in adults and children. Dr. Sulak received undergraduate degree in nutrition science and biology from Indiana University, a doctorate of osteopathy from the Arizona College of Osteopathic Medicine, and completed an osteopathic internship at Maine Dartmouth Family Medicine Residency. Dr. Sulak is the founder of Integrate Health, a medical practice in Maine providing specialty cannabis and integrative care to thousands of patients, and Healer.com, a medical cannabis education resource. Dr. Sulak, we are excited to have you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. And thank you to Americans for Safe Access and all the sponsors. Uh, ASA is an organization that, in my opinion, has successfully fulfilled its mission for years. They've been working so hard, and I, I can't imagine uh, what the world would be like today if we hadn't had ASA doing the advocacy work and uh, standing up for patients. So I'm just really honored to be a part of this and I, I love to support an event like this and have the opportunity to uh, teach and, and also to answer your questions. So thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen and get some slides up. Okay, does that, um, does that is, are you guys seeing the slides now? It says I'm sharing, yes, so if, we are. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay, great, great. Just organizing some windows here. So um, what I'd like to do to begin this is uh, talk about the evidence base, both preclinical meaning evidence, either from animal studies or uh, test tube type studies, as well as the clinical human evidence uh, supporting 
the idea that cannabis can be an effective treatment for some patients with autistic spectrum disorder and epilepsy. And I'm not uh, reviewing the evidence to try to prove this to anyone. I think it's important for us all to realize that we know some things about this topic and that there's a lot we don't know, but that these are two conditions that do not respond fully to conventional therapy and parents, patients, and doctors that are on the front lines of this uh, know that we need other options. And so as we move into uh, maybe um, options that haven't been fully validated by the conventional um, model of randomized controlled trials, uh, it, it's important to know what we know and to know what we don't know. So I'm happy to uh, summarize most of the evidence. If, if we were to cover it all, it'd be a much longer talk, but I think this will give you a good overview. So disclosure of potential financial conflicts of interest. I own my own medical practice in Maine. I'm an equity owner of a company called Healer, which does a lot of things in the cannabis world, including uh, education. And we also have hemp and medical cannabis products. I'm a paid advisor for Zalira Therapeutics, which is an Australian company that's been doing research and now products, as well as an, a paid advisor to Core Analytics, which is a, a startup that's going to be looking at analyzing data in the cannabis space. And then I'm an unpaid board of directors member of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, which is a wonderful membership organization. And if there are any clinicians uh, listening today and you're looking for uh, co colleagues to connect with and uh, some a professional support, I really encourage you to, to consider the SCC. Let's start with autism spectrum disorders. So um, just a review of the preclinical evidence. There's a number of animal models that uh, kind of uh, look at uh, autism-like features as they can be produced typically in rodents. It's not a uh, true autistic spectrum, but it mimics uh, some of the uh, features. And so what we know from, uh, from our basic understanding of the endocannabinoid system, even in normal uh, animals and humans, is that it regulates these kind of four major functions, social and emotional reactivity, learning and memory, the threshold for seizures, and circadian rhythm. And these are all things that can be disrupted in patients with autistic spectrum disorder. So it's something to think about that maybe there's a failure or a problem in the endocannabinoid system since it kind of ties together uh, four uh, domains that are commonly seen uh, presenting at the same time in many patients. There's also, uh, if we look at the animal studies as well as a, a human study, there's evidence that the endocannabinoid system is in fact dysregulated in autism. So looking at postmortem brains of individuals with autistic spectrum disorders, it looks like there are less CB1 receptors in their brains, especially in certain parts of the brain that are thought to be relevant. And so CB1 receptor is the target for our body's own endocannabinoids, as well as the target for THC and an indirect target for CBD. You'll be hearing a lot about that. So if someone has less CB1 receptors than expected, that's one way in which the endocannabinoid system could be dysregulated. And four different animal models have shown decreased or dysregulated endocannabinoid activity. Uh, it, these are the uh, autistic spectrum disorder models. Now looking at people that are alive, this was a study from 2019 where 93 children with ASD were compared with 93 age and gender matched neurotypical children. And they had their blood drawn and looked at the circulating levels of endocannabinoids. Now this isn't a perfect study. What we find for endocannabinoids in venous blood might not be the same as what we find in the brain, but there were some really interesting signals here uh, showing that in this first graph here, this is anandamide, which is really our primary endocannabinoid that functions so much like THC. You you can see the average level in the group with ASD was quite a bit lower than the average level in the control group here. If we look over at uh, OEA, which is an entourage endocannabinoid-like compound, seems to help anandamide do some of its work and have some of its own activity. Uh, again, we can see decreased levels in the autistic spectrum cohort and same with PEA. Uh, same same thing here, decreased levels in the autistic spectrum cohort. So these are th uh, an endocannabinoid and two endocannabinoid-like compounds that were found to be reduced in people with autism. Uh, the other major endocannabinoid, 2-AG, which is mentioned here on the left, 
excuse me, that was not reduced, but that, um, that level is much more relevant in the brain and not so much in the peripheral circulation. Now there's this uh, very complex chart, which I don't mean to, um, we're not gonna belabor this, but I'm just pointing out here, we have PEA, OEA, and AEA, anandamide. These are the three endogenous cannabinoids that were lower in the group with autism. And you can see that these endogenous cannabinoids are hitting all sorts of targets here. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, but here's the CB1 receptor and the TRPV1 capsaicin receptor, a couple other G protein, um, couple of receptors show up here. And what this chart is showing essentially is that CBD, whether directly or indirectly, can make up for some of the lack of activity here by hitting some of these same targets. And um, what this chart forgot to show is that THC is a really important component of that for directly stimulating the CB1 receptor. And this is gonna be a little bit of the theme throughout today. I know everyone loves to talk about CBD and CBD is wonderful, uh, but so is THC, especially in autism and epilepsy patients as far as my clinical practice has shown. And I'm sure you'll be hearing about that from Bonnie. So if we look at where did the literature start about using cannabis uh, for people with ASD? Well, there was a, a case report published in 2010 of a six-year-old boy with early infant autism, and uh, he was having severe behavioral issues. And so uh, his doctor treated him with dronabinol, which is a synthetic THC, 3.6 milligrams total daily, very low dose over the course of six months. It was basically two drops in the morning, one drop midday, and three drops in the evening. And he had this incredible improvement in his aberrant behavior checklist. Uh, if, in terms of hyperactivity, lethargy, irritability, stereotypic behavior, and inappropriate speech. Pretty much every domain improved without a single adverse effect. And this is another theme. This is a very low dose of THC, even for a six-year-old to be spread out over the day, but often low doses work better. And so you can see these are all the different domains of the aberrant behavior checklist, and you can see there was improvement globally. Um, moving forward, uh, some data from a colleague in Chile from 2017, and I think this is uh, truly real world. This was before uh, Chile even had uh, laboratories uh, to see what they were giving in terms of milligram doses. The doctors there were treating patients uh, with cannabis extracts. Uh, acete macerado, which means just um, kind of an oil infusion of cannabis. And so this was a cohort of 20 children and one adult with uh, autistic spectrum, uh, relatively equal distribution of the three severity levels. And two thirds were unsuccessfully treated with some pretty strong uh, drugs already, antipsychotics and uh, strong stimulant. So uh, about two thirds of them received this kind of one-to-one-ish uh, CBD THC extract, which um, they were able to analyze eventually. Some received just CBD dominant and others THC dominant over the course of around seven months. And you can see out of the 21 patients, uh, about four of them reported very much improved, 10 reported much improved, and six reported minimally improved. So there was some signal here in 20 of the 21 patients. Only one really didn't respond to cannabis, and I think that's a pretty good results. Uh, but how much were they taking? An incredibly small amount. I, I think this is the most surprising feature of this study. Uh, the range of the dose was, um, I mean, you can see how low it goes in terms of CBD and THC, but never really that high. The average CBD dose was just under two milligrams a day, and the average THC dose was under one milligram per day. So um, maybe more aggressive dosing would have taken some of these patients that were minimally improved or no change and helped. But even with this type of dosing, look at what look at what good results they had. And often low is better. So the CBD to THC ratio, the average among these patients was 1.6. Uh, now, moving on to um, an observational study of CBD-rich oil uh, in 60 children with autistic spectrum. This uh, was data out of Israel. Um, looking at sublingual administration of CBD, titrating up over two weeks, starting at one milligram per kilogram per day and working up to 10 milligrams per kilogram per day. So this is a more aggressive dosing, certainly, for over the course of seven to 13 months. And uh, what this data showed was that 61% of patients had significant improvement in behavior problems. Uh, following the cannabis treatment, 
about a third received fewer medications or were able to lower their dosage. A quarter were able to stop taking some of their medications and 8% received more medications. So it's again, it's not a perfect treatment, but I still think these are pretty good results. No control group, no placebo group, uh, just an observational study of what's happening on the front lines. 29 of these, um, they were, uh, just wanting to see the number here, so 60 children. So about half of the children didn't respond f uh, as well as the clinicians hoped to this original CBD dominant formulation. So then they switched to something with a little more THC in it. They went from 20 to one to six to one. And what they found was that of those 29 patients, about half of them uh, gained uh, additional um, benefits from this higher dose of THC and slightly lower dose of CBD, uh, significant benefits, and then they're slightly better in about seven. So I think that's um, a pretty typical clinical pattern is that if we're leaning too heavily on CBD and not seeing the results, uh, certainly something to consider is adding more THC. As far as adverse effects, uh, you can see that there was uh, very little sleep disturbance was the most common, followed by restlessness, nervousness, and loss of appetite. This very uh, closely mimics what I see in my practice uh, with a side effect profile of CBD. I think uh, unexplained laugh probably had something to do with the THC, uh, the group that received more THC. And then one girl had a transient serious psychotic event. Uh, it, it was not thought that this was really related to the treatment, but it could have been. She had a, a modest THC dose uh, that she was taking. Now, this study also showed the uh, little difference in the genders. So the red is the, uh, the whole group and the gray are just the boys. And so you can see here, as far as behavior, very much improved, a higher percentage of the boys scored very much improved uh, compared to the girls. Uh, excuse me, compared to the to the boys and girls mixed. And you can see that kind of stands out here. So um, there was a higher rate of these uh, very excellent responses in the, in the males compared to the females in this group, but certainly a response in the, in the females as well. Move forward to a little bit of uh, other observational data. This one, 188 patients uh, with restlessness, rage attacks, and agitation. They were also treated with a CBD dominant oil with an average dose of uh, about 80 milligrams uh, of CBD and four of THC given three times daily. That's um, aggressive dosing. That would be expensive for a lot of people, but um, effective for a lot. Uh, insomnia was treated with an evening dose of THC on average five milligrams. 30% reported a significant improvement, 54% moderate improvement, 7% slight improvement, and 9% had no change. I think this is very similar to what I would expect to see uh, in my patients. Of the 55 patients taking antipsychotic medications, 11 were able to discontinue, and three were able to reduce. So um, uh, more than a fifth were able to uh, decrease the dose of an antipsychotic. Here's a quality of life. So blue is before, orange is after six months. So you can see as far as quality of life, how many people reported, well, let's start over here, very bad. There were seven very bads before treatment and zero after. And you can see um, the, the percentage of uh, patients reporting a good or very good quality of life really went up after the after the treatment. So that's, that's what we're really looking for, even more than specific symptoms is quality of life. Here's another observational study, very similar findings, 53 children with autistic spectrum dis disorder. Uh, medium, median age was 11, treated for only a couple months here on average. Uh, again, with a, a CBD dominant oil uh, that was titrated up to a, a pretty high dose here, 16 milligrams per kilogram per day. And I hope that um, this is helping people get oriented. So what's a low dose, like 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram per day of CBD is, is you know, on the low side of responding. Uh, Epidiolex kind of treats in the range of two to 20 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, so you can see this is on the high side here. So uh, what happened with the outcomes? 
Self-injury and rage attacks out of 34 people, about two thirds had an improvement and some had a worsening of those symptoms. Hyperactivity, you can see improved again in about two thirds, no change in a third and worsened in just a couple. Um, sleep problems improved in many of the cases over two thirds and anxiety improved in almost half, but did worsen. This was um, kind of the, the biggest group of worsening would be anxiety. And that might be the same thing that was characterized by the other study as restlessness. Distinct from the two previous cohorts, the most common adverse effect, and this one was somnolence, which is tiredness, followed by decreased appetite. And so, um, you know, tiredness when taking CBD might be due to drug interactions. It might be due to other things that are in the CBD, like certain terpenes. Uh, it, it may be due to the CBD itself in some people. Okay, um, and then we're gonna wrap up some of these studies with ASC, but this is more of a, um, a mechanistic study looking at the functional MRI of 34 healthy men half of whom had ASD. And they were given a really high dose of CBD, 600 milligrams or placebo. And so what they found was that in the ASD group, but not the control group, the CBD made a couple changes. It increased the low frequency fluctuations in the cerebellar vermis and the right fusiform gyrus. These are brain regions that are thought to be relevant in autistic spectrum disorder. It also altered the functional connectivity of the vermis with several of its sub cortical target. So this isn't just the overall level of activity, but how it connects to other areas of the brain. That was thought to be a beneficial sign. So um, yeah, so just to wrap up, we have observational evidence that uh, cannabis, especially CBD dominant cannabis, but also some evidence that THC uh, dominant cannabis is helpful in patients with autism. I think that there's uh, evidence that it can be helpful at extremely low doses, but sometimes higher doses can be helpful as well. And, um, you know, it's just really hard to do uh, good clinical trials because this kind of uh, custom tailored um, you know, approach that happens in the clinic where we're constantly changing the ratios and the formulas and adjusting dosages. It's really hard to squeeze that in to a clinical trial. Let's talk about cannabis and epilepsy now. A bit more data here, but I'd like to start with this old study that looks at just the general population, uh, general population and the prevalence of epilepsy. So here is um, one, this is kind of like the baseline. And you can see there's a lot of risk factors that might predispose someone to having epilepsy. Like if there's been a military head injury, the uh, risk of having epilepsy is uh, about uh, 700 times the risk of someone uh, who doesn't have anything here. Uh, same with um, uh, civilian head injury, if somebody's uh, had a stroke or encephalitis, all of these things are kind of increasing the risk of having epilepsy. The one that really stands out here though, is that marijuana use is associated with a decreased risk of epilepsy. This isn't causative, but is there a signal there worth investigating that maybe there's a protective effect from some of the compounds in cannabis? Well, it's likely the answer is yes. Uh, not to mention that there's four millennia of historical evidence. Ancient Sumerians and Akkadian tablets uh, reference the use of a medicinal plant that's most likely cannabis for a host of ailments, including um, nocturnal convulsions. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, 4,000 years ago. Specific mentions of the treatment of epilepsy are found in the 11th century writings of Arabic uh, physician Al Mayusi, who advocated the use of leaf juice of cannabis through the nose to treat convulsions. O'Shaughnessy, who brought cannabis from India to Europe and to the Western world, reported treating infantile convulsions in 1840. And a prominent neurologist, Sir William Gower, described treating seizures with cannabis in 1881. So it's been in the medical literature as far as treating seizures for over a hundred years. Here's a, a statement from a, a peer-reviewed publication. Because of the therapeutic failures and because of the toxicity associated with the current, currently used anti-epileptics, the search for relatively non-toxic drugs with different mechanisms of action is an obvious goal in epilepsy research. Both the lack of toxicity and the anti-convulsant properties of CBD combine to enhance its therapeutic potential as an anti-epileptic. What year would you get, guess this was made? I should, we should use the polling feature here, um, but seriously, take a guess. This was published in 1979. 
So there's been decades that we've had this signal that we should be investigating the compounds in cannabis, including CBD for treating epilepsy, a condition that has really been needing better treatments. Uh, the new epilepsy drugs, um, the, certainly they work for some people, but if we look at the total prevalence of treatment refractory epilepsy, that hasn't really changed in decades. And, um, and we need a different uh, class of drugs that's safer, that have a different target. Cannabis is, is the answer. There's been a huge amount of preclinical evidence suggesting that cannabis and the compounds in cannabis can uh, treat seizures. So this is, um, so you can see how many different species of animals have been tested with each of the compounds, THC, CBD, other plant cannabinoids. And this data is actually a little old now. Uh, it's, it, the, the numbers are even higher. But um, look at this, 31 different animal models of seizure where THC um, has been tested. And 61% of the time, it's uh, had an anti-convulsant effect. And 29% of those studies, no effect. And in just a little bit, 10%, a pro-convulsant effect. And you can see the data for CBD and other plant cannabinoids. So we've had these signals coming from the animal literature for quite a long time. We talked about endocannabinoid system dysregulation in autism. There's also evidence that there's endocannabinoid system dysregulation in epilepsy. For example, 30 samples of the hippocampus, that's a part of the brain, uh, from patients with therapy-resistant temporal lobe epilepsy who had surgery to remove that part of the brain where the seizures were starting. If you look at those, um, that brain tissue compared to 11 controlled tissues uh, from people that did not have epilepsy, uh, the CB1, uh, the, this is the messenger RNA that creates uh, the protein that becomes the receptor of CB1. We talked about CB1 earlier. This was downregulated to a third of its control value of epileptic hippocampus. So that's like a 66% reduction in the level of that mRNA. That's a major difference. Expression of this enzyme, uh, DAG lipase, which produces 2-AG, a very important endocannabinoid in the brain, was also reduced by 60%. And when they used um, uh, histochemical immunolabeling uh, to look under a microscope at CB1, uh, what they found was that there was a decrease in the CB1 receptors on the, in the synapses that control glutamate. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter, but there wasn't a real change in the CB1 receptors in the GABA synapses. Uh, GABA is a relaxing neurotransmitter. So when it comes to seizures, glutamate is a big part of the problem and GABA is a part of the solution. Um, and the role of CB1 there is basically to get those um, nerves that release both of these to behave, to control uh, how much they're secreting. So when a nerve starts releasing too much glutamate, its neighbors send out an endocannabinoid signal to turn on CB1. And by turning on CB1, that tells the nerve, okay, stop sending out glutamate, that's enough. So in these brains, it looks like the ability to control or dampen glutamate release was significantly impaired uh, because of this endocannabinoid system problem. Another great suggestion for targeting that system in the treatment of epilepsy. These findings show that a neuroprotective machinery involving endocannabinoids is impaired in epileptic human hippocampus campus and imply that downregulation of CB1 receptors and related molecular components of the endocannabinoid system may facilitate the deleterious effects of increased network excitability, which is a, a susceptibility for seizures. So then this all really started back in 2013, um, of course, uh, with uh, Charlotte Figi in, in Colorado and eventually the CNN Sanjay Gupta documentary. And really um, this paper here, it was a survey, an internet survey uh, of, from Facebook of 150 families whose children were using CBD enriched cannabis formulas. Uh, and so um, there were only 19 responses and you can see some of these very difficult uh, to treat uh, conditions here. And the average number of previous prescriptions in this group was 12, which is just an incredible number. And sorry, the, the writing's a little small on this slide, but basically in this really tough 
group, uh, you know, challenging to treat patients, 84% reported some response to CBD, which is amazing. And two of the 19 actually had complete remission of their seizures, and eight had a greater than 80% reduction in seizure frequency, frequency, which is a really strong uh, value here. You can see the adverse events, drowsiness and fatigue were really, um, you know, not that intense, uh, not serious for sure. And there were side benefits. And I want to keep highlighting this. So better mood, increased alertness, better sleep. And I think a lot of what you'll probably hear later in the day is that um, CBD is doing so much more than controlling seizures for a lot of these patients. It's really improving many domains of function in life. Uh, this was just a survey, a very preliminary survey with no control group, but that got a lot of excitement around it. Uh, there was another um, uh, parental report, so kind of observational study of 75 patients in Colorado. Uh, th so this is now 2015. People had started moving to Colorado to get treated uh, because they weren't allowed to use cannabis in their home state. Uh, there was, uh, it was really an exciting and kind of dangerous uh, time in, in the world of cannabis and, and pediatric neurology. 75 patients that were using uh, cannabis extract, 57% reported it some improvement, and 33% reported a greater than 50% uh, improvement in seizures. No difference in response rate by seizure type. Uh, there was a, a, you know, no difference in response rate depending on the strain of CBD versus mixed strains. Uh, T, the THCA patients did not seem to improve in this group. But, um, you know, something that's interesting is that the response rate for families moving from out of state to Colorado was 47% versus only 22% for those already there. And three times as great for those uh, that were reporting this greater than 50% seizure response. So, um, you know, I think it's, uh, I, I can't imagine what it's like. I'm a parent, but my, my children thankfully don't have seizures. And I'm sure uh, I've just talked to so many families. I know it's just incredibly challenging to have that objective perspective and, and really understand what's working and, and what's not working. And that's why there's uh, tools uh, like apps and trackers and checking in with your clinician. And um, if there's a co-parent there, that's always very helpful. Uh, but I think uh, self-report is something that we, we can't fully rely on uh, for some of this data, but it's, it's the only thing we have in many cases. So uh, just one more observational study, uh, CBD uh, treating uh, intractable pediatric epilepsy, more Israeli data. And in this um, cohort, they split the patients up into those taking less than 10 milligrams per kilogram per day and greater than 10. So you can see there were 60 patients in the low dose group and 14 patients in the high dose group. Um, so first of all, one signal that I oops, want to point out is that 13 of these patients experienced more seizures. And this is one of the risks of using cannabis, whether it's CBD or THC or, or really any anti-epileptic drug could potentially make seizures worse. Uh, again, you see uh, tiredness as the uh, most common adverse effect followed by some uh, GI adverse effects. So um, the THC doses, dosage remained very low for all of these patients. And um, sorry, I want to point out the results. So let's just take a look here at um, how many people had a greater than 75% reduction of seizures, 10 out of 60 in the low dose group versus three out of 14 in the high dose group. So a little bit better percentage in the high dose group, but not much. And you can see a lot of patients responded in this lower dose group. Uh, so more isn't always better, but um, how many people had zero response? I mean, eight out of 74 uh, had zero response. It's, um, it's something that helps a lot of people. And often the question is, how much does it help? So then um, this is a study from 2016 uh, where kind of mainstream neurology was starting to uh, really look at this. And so this is Oren Davinsky, uh, his, his first open label uh, trial. So this was not a controlled trial, just an observational trial in 214 uh, or I, I guess they had follow-up with 162 patients that were using CBD in this, uh, you know, starting off at moderate doses, two to five milligrams per kilogram and going all the way up to 50 milligrams per kilogram. So really pushing it. 
Um, it's a little hard to see here, but I like this chart. So each little blue line here uh, would be a patient. And if the blue line is going upwards, it means that the seizures increased. And if the blue line is going downwards, it means that the seizures decreased. So you can see while there was a, um, an exacerbation of seizures in, in you know, quite a few patients here, uh, the vast majority had a reduction in seizures and quite a, a big distribution from a little reduction to um, full resolution of their seizures, which you can see over here on the right. Uh, sedation was prominent when treated with clobazam, which is an anti-epileptic drug, and uh, uh, median, change, median change in total seizures was 34 per, uh, percent, uh, and it was most effective with the focal seizures. So then there was the randomized controlled trial, the double-blind trial for Dravet syndrome, which eventually led to Epidiolex getting approved. And I'm not going to uh, belabor all of this data, but it was a high dose of CBD, 20 milligrams per kilogram over the course of 14 weeks. And what happened was the uh, median frequency of monthly seizures in the CBD group went from 12 and a half down to about six, whereas in the placebo group, it didn't even change by one whole point. So this was a statistically significant improvement. And a, of course, a, a cohort that uh, had previously been very hard to treat, uh, drug-resistant uh, Dravet syndrome. And so that's exciting, exciting data that led to the approval of uh, Epidiolex. And, um, you know, I was just surprised that the quality of life scales didn't really change between CBD and placebo because that's something we see so often in our clinical practice. And maybe that has to do with the difference between artisanal cannabis and uh, pharmaceutical grade uh, CBD. It's hard to know. Uh, but then since that study, there's been three other randomized controlled trials looking at Epidiolex. And what uh, this meta-analysis of all four trials showed, so a total of 550 patients, uh, the average improvement in seizure frequency with CBD at 10 and 20 milligrams per kilogram per day versus placebo was 19.5 and 19.9% respectively. So interesting, the higher dose, uh, you know, the average looking at all four studies, the higher dose didn't really show a much stronger effect than the lower dose. 50% uh, reduction in all seizure types occurred in over a third of patients receiving the high dose and uh, about 21% of patients receiving placebo. So that's a, that's a significant difference there, but it also demonstrates the high placebo effect associated with the parental reported outcomes. And maybe there is something to that. You know, I just, I'll, I'll stop here and just comment that in every drug that's ever been tried, you know, in the history of uh, drug trials, there's been someone in the placebo group who's had an inner pharmacy that's been able to reproduce the effect of that drug without actually taking that drug. I think that's amazing. You know, we often think, oh, placebo response, let's not talk about that. That's a confounder. Uh, to me, that's a, a symbol of our uh, incredible physiology that we all have that we we often just need to unlock. And I think that things like hope and paying more attention and uh, all, the, all the subtle changes that happen uh, that, that might be happening when someone's going through a clinical trial, um, that can turn on the inner physiology. Now, what's interesting is if, if you were to think about, is there some physiologic system that could kind of mimic any drug that's ever been tried, drugs in neurology and gastroenterology and in every field of medicine, what system could be a part of this placebo response? Well, the obvious answer is the endocannabinoid system. And there's uh, some evidence to support that endocannabinoid activity is a part of the pl placebo response. So I, I think that's really worth pointing out that maybe uh, it was a difference in just um, the observation but maybe it was a lot more than that. Maybe something was turning on inside of these patients when they were taking the placebo. Uh, Bonnie Goldstein and I presented, or I mean published uh, some data, mostly from her practice uh, on 272 patients with refractory epilepsy. Uh, you can see here that 14% uh, of the patients received no benefit. Everyone else, 86% of these challenging cases received some benefit from cannabis and, um, and quite a few had uh, an excellent response. So this 10% had 100% uh, seizure reduction and another 28% had greater than a 75% seizure reduction. So that's, um, that's pretty much what we see. A wide range of effective doses of CBD all the way 
rate from 0 0.05 up to nine. Uh, it seemed from our data, like the blood level of CBD wasn't really correlated with, uh, with response. And then I also presented some case reports of THCA preventing seizures and THC being able uh, to be used to abort a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. And I was going to show a video of um, this happening, but I'm just going to skip that for today. But essentially, this, uh, this was a, a patient who um, went very public, and her mom would rub THC oil under her gums during a, a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, and it would, it would abort it uh, much faster and better than diazepam or midazolam. And then I uh, just some much more recent data, which I think, again, kind of shows what's possible outside of this uh, kind of tunnel vision CBD model. So these are just five patients, a case series of five patients from Italy uh, with seizures, and I put their ages here. So some uh, children and some adults, uh, a number of previous anti-epileptic drugs for all of them. So these are all very treatment uh, resistant uh, cases. Um, still on high doses of a lot of these drugs, uh, some with some comorbidities. And you can see um, the effective dose over here and the seizure reduction. So here's a 21-year-old that was taking a total of 18 milligrams of THC and one milligram of CBD per day. And um, it started at 20 generalized tonic clonic seizures monthly, so almost one a day, had a 60% a reduction in seizures. This is, again, not a high dose. Uh, you can see uh, even lower dose in an 18-year-old with West syndrome, THC dominant, 600 generalized tonic clonics per month, so 20 a day, 80% reduction from 12 milligrams of THC per day. This Maybe this CBD was helping, but this is mostly a THC uh, treatment here. And you can see also very low dose of uh, CBD here, 7.2 milligrams total daily in a 15-year-old who is having 10 seizures a month had an 80% reduction. Uh, again, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I know I'm making my point. Low doses can go a long way for some patients, and so can low doses of THC. Um, case two showed improved quality and duration of sleep, social interaction, and reduced spasticity. Another case had improved alertness, improved sleep, improved mood. Uh, case four, the parents reported quality and duration of sleep was better, movement was better. Uh, case five had one episode of panic attack, and that was a THC dominant 25 year old. So maybe that was a little too too much THC in that case. But um, that's that's real world data. It's not randomized controls, but it just shows what's possible. And then I want to talk just a little bit about artisanal preparations of cannabis versus pharmaceutical preparations of cannabis, because they all have their place. Uh, but this was a, um, and, and we all have access to different uh, types of medicine, you know, depending on our situation. But this was a review of 11 publications through December of 2017 that looked at uh, data on patients that were using artisanal cannabis and the pure CBD or the pharmaceutical grade CBD. All the studies they included uh, had objective measurements of seizure frequency. So the data that Bonnie and I published wasn't actually included in this because that was just a parental report. But what you can see here is that in terms of reported improvement, there was a much higher level of some improvement reported in the CBD-rich cannabis extracts compared to the purified CBD. As far as patients that were reporting a really strong improvement, greater than 50% reduction in seizures, slightly higher numbers in the purified CBD group compared to the artisanal cannabis, but not statistically significant. So that's about equal right there. But here's the huge difference. Average daily dose, 6.1 milligrams per kilogram in the cannabis extract group versus 27 milligrams per kilogram in the purified CBD group. So we're using more than four times the dose over here and uh, not really getting much better results, but yes, getting more of the mild and more of the severe adverse effects. Because when you get up into this high dosing range, uh, there's interactions with other drugs and of course there's other adverse effects. Now, why was this uh, at 6.1? Probably a number of factors. Um, I suspect uh, cost is one because it's really expensive unless you're just treating a, a little baby to, to get up to 27 milligrams per kilogram per day. If you're paying out of pocket, that's really not possible for most people. 
But beyond cost, I think that efficacy also influenced this and that people were tending to see better results at lower doses. Why? Because of all these other compounds in the cannabis plant that have anti-epileptic properties. And even when they're present in very small doses, like they are in some of these artisanal extracts, it seems like there's a synergistic effect and that they can work together. So this was that paper uh, that that quote came from in 1979. And you can see they tested not just CBD and THC, but all these other trace cannabinoids, which showed signal in animal models of epilepsy. I uh, just want to bring a little focus and attention to the acidic cannabinoids before I uh, turn it over to Bonnie. So this was a paper from uh, this uh, this year, I believe, that looked at uh, CBDA, THCA, and a number of other acidic cannabinoids. So what do I mean acidic? Basically, when the cannabis plant makes a cannabinoid compound, it makes it in its acid form. The acid form is this little aspect of the molecule here, this, uh, this carboxylic acid. So the plant makes THCA, it makes CBDA. It doesn't make THC and CBD. Then when we heat that, or even just let it sit at room temperature for a long time, this little acid group will leave the molecule and it will become its neutral counterpart. So THCA becomes THC, CBDA becomes CBD. And they have very different properties in the body. So this uh, animal study, which was a mouse model of Dravet syndrome, showed that CBDA uh, does get into the brain, even though not nearly as well as CBD, uh, and it has an anticonvulsant effect there. And what I wanted to uh, point out is that many studies, not just in seizures, but also studies of uh, especially nausea and vomiting, show that CBDA can be much more powerful uh, than its um, uh, uh, decarboxylation product CBD. So in this mouse model, CBDA had an anti-convulsant effect at 10 milligrams per kilogram and no additional benefit at 30 milligrams per kilogram. But a previous study doing the same model with CBD, it required 100 milligrams per kilogram. So in this mouse model of Dravet syndrome, CBDA was about 10 times more potent than CBD. There's other studies that show CBDA might be a thousand times more potent than CBD, depending on the mechanism of action in the target. There are some problems with artisanal cannabis. So while many of them might have a little CBDA in it or some terpenes or some of these other cannabinoids, there's also this whole industry that's um, become really challenging for patients. So this was published in 2017, uh, showing that out of uh, 40 cannabis oil products that were tested, uh, less than half, only 45% or 18 of them were accurately labeled. Uh, a quarter were under-labeled and 30% were over-labeled. So um, can you believe the label of the CBD product you're buying? I hope so. I think there's absolutely trustworthy manufacturers out there. Hard sometimes for the consumer to find them and know who they are. There's been a number of investigative reports also like this one. And I don't necessarily believe everything that these you know promote. I'm not sure if the labs they're using have an agenda or, or anything. It's just hard to know. But there's a lot of signals coming out out showing that some products are supposedly having four times the amount of lead uh, than approved by the uh, EPA, um, uh, pesticide that exceeded California's acceptable standards, and less than half of the samples tested uh, that actually had the stated amount of CBD in the product. So it's, it's hard to know. Here's a different uh, investigative report from Austin uh, testing 240 CBD products for 30 contaminants and labeling ac accuracy. Uh, uh, they reported 70% were highly contaminated with metals, uh, herbicides, and uh, toxic mold and pesticides. Uh, one had lead levels 100 times the EPA max for drinking water and uh, more than half had labels that inaccurately reflected CBD, CBD concentration. That's out of 240 products. So um, lots of problems in our industry. And I, I, I'm sure that this group has a lot of, um, a lot of cohesion in terms of uh, communication and helping people find good products. Um, so just real quick um, risk benefit considerations when I'm thinking about treating patients with epilepsy. Uh, it's important to know that about a third of patients with epilepsy have symptoms that don't fully respond to conventional treatment. Let's just start there. So conventional treatment um, 
works for about two thirds of people, which is wonderful. Although over 20 new seizure medications have been developed over the past several decades, the percentage of patients with medically intractable seizures has not changed significantly. I mentioned that earlier. The failure of the first anti-epileptic drug strongly predicts failure to other anti-epileptic drugs and are associated with poor prognosis. Children with absence epilepsy, for example, who fail their first drug are three, three times more likely to progress to myoclonic epilepsy and eight times more likely to intractable epilepsy, meaning they're not eight times more likely not to respond to all the other drugs that are given to them. Uh, similarly, after failing three therapeutic regimens, the chance of responding to a fourth is about 12% in childhood epilepsy. So I, I think there's a lot of evidence that if somebody has gone the conventional route and tried even just one drug, and certainly if they've tried two or three drugs, um, very, very low likelihood that adding additional drugs is going to provide a significant benefit. It might, but in most patients, it doesn't. So my question is, when is it time to not try that next drug, but to try a cannabis product. And I think um, second line therapy and in patients with a uh, strong personal preference, um, uh, perhaps even first line therapy, that's, that's um, kind of my assessment here. Exacerbation of seizures during cannabis trial is uncommon, but it does happen. We see that, you saw it in some of the data. And then cannabis withdrawal can potentiate seizures also. So like losing access to medicine, finding something that really works, it's working for a while, the other medications are tapered, and then suddenly that product is no longer the same and it doesn't work the same, that's a problem. Uh, going to the hospital and not being able to give the medicine that's needed uh, that's been working because it's a kind of an over-the-counter herbal medicine traveling out of state. So there are um, challenges uh, to maintaining consistent treatment, many challenges. And then there's some drug interactions uh, with CBD, which are important and typically show up just at high doses. Uh, but you can see um, some of these on the slides and uh, this study is available and I'm certainly happy to get you those. I'm not gonna uh, just go through all of these. I think the strongest signals are, are with clobazam, people getting more sedation and elevated liver enzymes with valproic acid. Then I just want to um, make a quick comment about rare conditions. So um, as cannabis clinicians, uh, Bonnie and I and our colleagues are uh, kind of magnets for some of these uh, really rare cases, conditions that are um, you know, genetic or uh, birth trauma or uh, severe injuries, of course, outside of the realm of neurology, but very much inside neurologic uh, care as well. And I've just found cannabis to be an incredible treatment for uh, many of these patients, including the pediatric patients, and especially those at the end of life. It's, it's just such a compassionate, uh, effective medicine there. And I, I really think it should always be considered just a little data on that. I mean, this is dronabinol. This is synthetic THC that's approved. It's in every pharmacy. Uh, this, this was um, a case series of eight severely effective children with degenerative diseases, post-traumatic syndrome, epilepsy, and hypoxic encephalopathy. These tiny, tiny doses of THC were given, and there were prominent positive changes in seizures, spasms, social interaction um, with prominent palliation and fatal diseases. I mean, these doses are so tiny and it can be just so effective. I really wanna emphasize that. And then an, another case series from 2000. One uh, where again, average dose of THC 0.2 milligrams per kilogram administered to 13 severely neurologically impaired children aged seven months to 17 years with a uniform benefit on spasticity and pain in all uh, 13 of them and improved sleep in 10 of them. Longest treatment duration with five years, no evidence of tolerance or dose escalation. When we get the dose of THC right, people tend not to build tolerance to it. And then there were 50 patients aged three months or greater that were treated for nausea and inanition from chemotherapy. They also benefited from these low doses, no serious side effects. Um, uh, one patient had an accidental tenfold overdose, no withdrawal effects. No, I mean, very self-limited overdose symptoms. It wasn't toxic. Um, it's just an amazing treatment. So I, I 
just want everyone to keep in mind uh, THC as well. So thank you so much uh, for the time. I appreciate your attention. I hope this was helpful so you can see what the sci scientific evidence is and where it's lacking. I do have my own line of hemp products. We have CBD and CBD oils that just came out last month. It's harvested at a farm near my house uh, that grows organically and uh, produced in a factory uh, right around the corner. And I supervise the quality control. I know the labeling's accurate. We have certificates of analysis online. So if you're looking for CBD products you can trust that I think are really high quality. We go to great lengths not to expose these uh, materials to heat and pressure so that we can create a CBDA product, preserve the terpenes and so forth. Um, you can use the coupon code ASA and we'll give you a 20% discount and also 20% donation uh, to Americans for safe access. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Sulak. That was, that was absolutely amazing. I'm going to send that presentation to every single medical professional I know and say you have to watch this. Thank you so much. Um, and we also had a question about where to find some CD, CBD products that, are, that we can trust. So I appreciate you um, um, uh, giving that discount out to our um, community. Um, so next we have uh, Dr. Bonnie Goldstein. She is the medical director of Canna Center's Wellness and Education, a California-based medical practice specializing in the use of cannabis for serious and chronic medical conditions. After years of working in the specialty of pediatric emergency medicine, she developed an interest in the science of medical cannabis after witnessing its beneficial effects in an ill friend. Since then, she has evaluated thousands of patients for use of medical cannabis. She has a special interest in treating children with intra intractable epilepsy, autism, cancer, and other conditions. Dr. Goldstein's book, Cannabis is Medicine, um, from Little Brown Spark, will be published uh, this month, and we're excited to learn more about that. Uh, Dr. Goldstein, thank you for your time here. Thank you so much. Well, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. And bear with me here one second. There we go. Share and hmm. all right. Can everybody see my slides? Yep. We okay, can see. Great. And thank you. Um, uh, to Americans for Safe Access and all the sponsors for this opportunity to share uh, all of this uh, information with people. And I know um, uh, Dustin and I have done this before where we've talked about the research and then uh, we talk about uh, the um, clinical. And so um, Dustin has done a fantastic job as usual going over all of the uh, research that we have up to date. And um, remember that because of the Schedule One status, we are still not allowed to do uh, clinical uh, human trials. And uh, I certainly know that that's held back a lot of physicians from uh, wanting to use cannabis. I think, you know, one of the things is the results speak for themselves, as you can see with um, uh, the research or at least the ob observational retrospective. And unfortunately, um, we're still in that uh, bad place of, of not being able to research cannabis in, in the year of 2020. And certainly I know ASA is working on that as is normal and some of the other uh, advocacy groups, but all of us need to, we're just gonna get political for one second. We have an election coming up. Before you vote, look into how uh, the people you might be voting for feel about cannabis. It's really important uh, to know their, their stance and to uh, put people in who are pro-science and uh, have nothing to fear with cannabis. Let's just figure it out so we can know more and we can help more people. Anyway, so um, let me figure out how to change my slides here. Here you go. So here's my disclosures. I'm the owner and medical director of Canna Centers. I'm medical advisor to Weed Maps as well as Alira Therapeutics in Australia. And I'm a board member of the International Association of, uh, for Cannabinoid Medicines. And I'm gonna go through some topics. I'm gonna talk about the available phytocannabinoids. 
how they work in terms of their mechanisms of action, uh, how to treat pediatric, or at least an approach to pediatric epilepsy, an approach to autism, some case reports, and that we call uh, clinical pearls. These are tips that um, that we pick up when we are treating many patients. Uh, you see trends. You the only way we call it the practice of medicine because that's that's exactly how we. Uh, learn about uh, medications and how people respond to them. So this is um, uh, hopefully uh, will be helpful to those of you uh, who are watching this. So let's talk about the phytocannabinoids. And um, um, Dr. Sulak did mention some of these. Um, depending on where you live, uh, you will have access to various uh, products. I'm in California where uh, we had the first medical cannabis law from 1996. Um, and although we had a law, we had a very unregulated situation up until about 2018. Regulations have had uh, pros and cons, which I'm not going to get into, but ultimately uh, all of these compounds are now available to patients uh, in California. And so I've had the luxury to try uh, all of these compounds in my patients, both adults and children. And it's important to understand that Although uh, products may be labeled CBD, uh, remember they're not all the same. They're grown at different farms. They have different ratios. They have different um, uh, uh, amounts of, of the different compounds in them, which I'm going to get into a little further. And remember that labeling is very important. And also um, the COA, the Certificate of Analysis, that's what tells you what's in the bottle. The label is important, but remember, you can't always go by the label, as Dustin pointed out, and you must, must, must get that COA in order to know what is in your bottle. But remember that uh, reading the label at least points you in the right direction. If you are looking for a one-to-one -one ratio, you want to make sure it just doesn't say THC, that it actually has some uh, uh, labeling on it that, that allows you to know uh, uh, what is in it. All right, now I wanna uh, talk about um, the CBD mechanisms of action. So, you know, I can't, you know, before COVID when I was on planes and in restaurants, I would constantly hear about people talking about CBD, you know, behind me or in front of me on a plane or in a restaurant or, you know, even standing in line at the grocery store, you'd see a CBD for sale and people would start talking about it. And it has now this reputation of being kind of the panacea for everything under the sun. But really, what do we know about it in terms of uh, what is it doing for us and how does it work? Oops, sorry. And um, I have given this lecture in the past. It's a uh, big lecture to give, so it's, uh, I don't have time to go through everything here. But as you can see, CBD has many, many, many targets. It turns out that CBD probably has over 70 targets in the brain and in the body. And it targets many receptors, including the cannabinoid receptor, but not in the same way that uh, THC uh, is more of a direct uh, binding to the, C uh, to the cannabinoid receptor, where CBD kind of binds at an offsite in order to regulate what's going on at the receptor. But it also has many other receptors. And as you can see here, I've labeled with red, uh, lettering A for autism, E for epilepsy, I for inflammation, G for gut inflammation. I've included inflammation and gut inflammation because for uh, neurologic conditions, we know that the immune system and the gut play a big role. Uh, what you eat matters um, and how you take care of your body matters. Um, but sometimes these are off just from uh, the beginning of life. And often we can see these imbalances uh, in very young children. And it is nice to know is CBD, where is it working and what is it targeting? And so when we look at the various uh, receptors, you can see we've labeled, there's multiple targets that are focusing on either the mechanisms of action or underlying pathophysiology of autism, epilepsy, inflammation. Remember too, CBD doesn't just work at receptors, it also works at enzymes, as you can see the list there, and ion channels and transporters. Transporters are compounds that move uh, chemicals around in our body. And one of the main things that we know about CBD is that it enhances anandamide. And Dr. Sulak uh, went over uh, the role of anandamide. It is your inside, your inner cannabis compound that helps to tell the cells 
to regulate. It helps to, in, let's say in epilepsy, dial down the message of having a seizure. Um, and so we know that from some of these studies that children have uh, a, an imbalance in their anandamide and CBD can help balance that through the transporters, not necessarily through uh, receptors. So it's important to understand that CBD is targeting many different places in the brain and body. And one of the things that I want to share with everybody is that makes it very difficult to predict the reaction. Uh, I have seen uh, patients who CBD is the solution to everything that's going on and other patients, it doesn't work at all. How do we um, explain these differences is what is the underlying status of that person's various um, uh, physiology and how is CBD interacting at that physiology? So it's very complex to try to guess how somebody is going to react to CBD. But as you just learned, it's extremely safe and certainly there's no downside in my view of trying it. Um, when we look at CBG, cannabigerol, we use this uh, here. Uh, it is available. Um, I think throughout the nation from some companies that have it under the hemp designation and uh, there are some specific medical cannabis products in California that have uh, a dominance of CBG and as you can see it also has multiple targets uh, and again this is why it's very hard to predict how somebody uh, will uh, react and I'm going to go over uh, a little bit later in this um, uh, show in this uh, slideshow um, how we might use CBG and really what I have found clinically, uh, how it helps children. But as you can see, there's, and if you look back, there's a lot of overlap between how CBD and CBG work. And for some people that might be beneficial in terms of synergy of, of um, action. And for some people it may uh, help fill in the gaps. And for some, there may be some uh, overlap that's not beneficial because their underlying physiology doesn't allow for that. Uh, THCA, which we use a lot um, here in uh, my practice, um, also has multiple targets uh, in the brain and body. And one of its um, main um, uh, acts is neuroprotectant antioxidant and as well as uh, anti-inflammatory through the COX-1 and COX-2. Um, here we look at CBDA, which uh, Dustin did a great job of going over. What's fascinating about uh, CBDA is that it has the same GPR55 um, antagonist. And if you look back at CBD, it has the GPR55 antagonism as well. And it, this is what is thought to be one of the main reasons that uh, these compounds are anti-epileptic. Uh, what happens at this receptor is that this receptor, when there are seizures, um, kind of it gets kind of overstimulated and starts to trigger more seizures and spread the um, uh, kind of seizure focus to other brain cells. And when uh, CBD and CBDA block that mechanism, it blocks uh, further uh, seizures. So that is one of the main areas of research now looking at how do these compounds affect this particular, and this is a receptor. Uh, a G protein coupled receptor. And so um, remember too, as Dustin started off his talk, there's, there's a lot we know, but there's also a lot we don't know. And still the anti-epileptic and also uh, uh, anti-autism effects are still being sorted out. Um, THC, which, you know, a lot of people still say THC is the bad compound and CBD is the good cannabinoid. You know, I disagree with that. I use a lot of THC in my practice under medical supervision, um, starting low and going slow, uh, we can find some really nice results with THC. And as you saw from some of the studies that uh, Dustin quoted, uh, it, THC can be extremely helpful in patients that have some imbalance in their endocannabinoid system. And again, multi-targets. We used to say that THC was monogamous and uh, only uh, acted at the CB1 and CB2 receptor, but we know now that it has multiple other actions as well. Now, when we look at um, kind of products in, in the cannabis market, I know it's very difficult for people to know, you know, is this a good product? What's in this? How do I know if this is gonna work? So 
uh, instead of using the word strain, um, we talk about something called chemovars, chemical varieties. And remember that the genetics of the plant dictate uh, what cannabinoids are going to be dominant or even mixed in there in what amount, and also the terpenes, which remember are the essential oils that help add benefits and give physiologic effects on their own, but in addition to it kind of synergistic with the phytocannabinoids. So remember the phytocannabinoids plus the terpenoids gives a specific physiologic effect. And remember, the cannabis plant has over 500 different compounds, some of which we really haven't even studied. Most of these compounds are significantly understudied. Uh, more research is clearly indicated so that we can really understand when you look at um, something like CBG, there just is not a lot of studies yet. And hopefully that's, you know, kind of what I expect in the next five to 10 years is to hopefully see uh, these studies. So we call the various, what we used to say strains, the real correct terminology is chemovars. Our friend, Dr. Ethan Russo says a strain is something you get in your back, not, um, uh, and there are strains of viruses or bacteria, but there are no strains of cannabis. So we're going to use the word chemovar. And it's important to look at what's in uh, the plant so that you can kind of have an educated guess on what the effects might be. So if you have something that's like a CBD or CBG dominant or both, and you add in these particular terpenes, you may get an, expect an anti-anxiety, a better mood, improved focus because of uh, the mechanism of action of these compounds. And then here's just another one, a THCA plus THC, maybe uh, with some beta caryophyllin, which is very anti-inflammatory, linalool, which is calming and relaxing, myrcene also, uh, which helps with pain and relaxation. You can see that you may get pain relief, anti-inflammatory, and also some uh, potent anti-nausea effects because THCA and THC both do that. But my point really with this slide is that it is crucial for patients to have access to different products to find what works for them. Having two or three products to pick from, or let's say a high ratio CBD and a low ratio CBD, just two, uh, that does not give people enough flexibility to find uh, what works for their specific needs. Some, here in California, we have tons of products available and still some of my patients cannot find what works, but then they have access to cannabis flower, many, many, many chemovars available. And so some of my patients will go and purchase the flower and then go home and make their own tinctures so that they can find the strain that works best for their or their child's condition. And I think that's a very important thing to understand is that if something isn't working for you, it may be that you haven't found the right chemovar, the right kind of um, cocktail or concoction uh, that fits your chemistry. Now, in terms of pediatric epilepsy, of course, uh, my I, I just listed my approach here because there's um, so much um, uh, controversy over how to do this. And I have to say, there isn't really one right way to do this. This is my approach. I know Dr. Sulak and other uh, doctors who treat pediatric epilepsy patients have a similar approach, we're, we're actually quite conservative in our approach because we don't want to miss the sweet spot dose by just committing a, a child to a very high dose. First of all, if it's out of pocket, that would be very expensive, but also the lowest dose that gives the best result is really what we are looking for. So after I do a history of physical review of previous and current medications, I try to go through all the supplements that a child is taking. What normally in a patient with uh, epilepsy, I will start with a whole plant um, a CBD product. And um, sorry here, oh, I did list here. So for ratios, I usually start somewhere in the higher ratio range. And basically we start low dose, we assess the response, and then we increase every one to two weeks. It is a bit labor intensive to check in every one to two weeks with a doctor via email or phone call. But this is what needs to be done so that um, the next steps are based on how the child responds. Um, and usually I start around one milligram per kilo per day, sometimes lower in a child who might be on multiple medications or whose uh, parents have reported to me that they're uh, very uh, sensitive to medication changes. And then I'll increase in one milligram per kilo per day increments. Again, sometimes we adjust that depending on 
uh, the particulars uh, in that particular case. I have found the therapeutic range to be about four to 20 milligram per kilo per day. Some of my patients take every eight hour dosing, some patients take um, every 12 hour dosing. Uh, in general, uh, what I try to do is listen to the patient's body. If the patient, um, I, and I had a case like this where a child went, uh, she was having hundreds of seizures a day, and by the sixth day at the lowest dose that we started her on, she was down to about 12 seizures a day, but the time that, timing she was having the seizures was kind of at the eight hour mark. And so she had started on every 12 hours, and then there was this little gap between eight and 12 hours where she would start having seizures. And it became clear that probably what was happening was her CBD levels were starting to drop at that point. And so we switched her to every eight hours and uh, uh, she did very well after that with significant reduction of seizures. Now the Chemovar, the extraction method and the oil base. So remember some of these products are extracted through an alcohol extraction. Some are extracted uh, through a, what we call a CO2 or carbon dioxide extraction method. For some patients, it matters. So there's so many variables involved. Usually we start with one product and then we try to keep track of the variables so that if we have to change things, we may say, gee, this one was alcohol extracted, let's switch to CO2 or vice versa. And also the oil base matters. Some patients do better on an olive oil base, some do better on a coconut oil base or MCT oil base. And again, these, these particulars are usually something that we don't worry about in the beginning of treatment. We pick a product, we go from there, and then as we move forward, we try to sort it out. And so one thing I'll tell people is anybody looking at this, any physician who wants to do this, you have to have patience and you have to understand that it's going to be a um, process. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint to, uh, to figure it out. And again, uh, Dustin walk, uh, talked about the side effects and they are uncommon uh, in clinical practice, but they can occur and mostly they occur at high doses. Sedation, usually that is because there are other medications on board and, and when CBD dosing goes up, we start to see this compound because CBD can be sedating in high doses and these other medications are sedating, we get this compounded effect. GI upset, diarrhea, decreased appetite, increased seizures it definitely can happen and usually um, in, in not very many patients. In my experience, less than 10% of patients have these. Um, and we do address it by trying to tweak the dosing um, or tweak the timing. And uh, we try to work to change these side effects. Now, in terms of products, so again, I, I recommend higher ratios when starting. And again, I've said it already a few times, check the COA, the Certificate of Analysis. Some of my families even get the uh, products tested independently. They will uh, buy a product and send a couple of milliliters to a laboratory to get it tested without telling the lab where it came from, who's, uh, who uh, made it, so that we can be sure that there are uh, no contaminants such as residual solvents, pesticides, heavy metals, and microbials. Here in California, there's still a robust underground market uh, and for some patients, that's the only way that they can afford their medication. And for me, that is a uh, deal breaker without a test. And I have found a number of products that patients have purchased and have been using that had very, and, and of all of these things, the, the uh, thing that was the highest was the solvents and then occasionally the heavy metals. So you have to remember that um, anything you buy online that might be considered under the hemp version, Remember that it is not regulated right now. There is nobody uh, regulating those companies. So you must ask for the COA. COA and if you are uh, nervous about it, get it tested yourself. Um, if you are purchasing a product that is um, a high CBD product from a licensed dispensary, those products here in California have been tested at least twice and in other states, I know they go through uh, testing as well. Those you can be pretty sure that they're accurate. Uh, many states uh, do have um, significant, uh, significantly strict uh, regulations. Some are a little uh, more loose, but remember that through a licensed dispensary, it also may be a little bit more expensive. And so you try to have to balance quality and cost uh, by doing the best you can, which has made it somewhat difficult for patients. Now, how do you figure out the cost? So I've had families say to me, how come I can't just go buy a bottle that has um, is $60? How come I'm buying 
the bigger bottle that's $250. And remember that a, if your child or a patient is taking you know, 200 milligrams a day for epilepsy and you buy a bottle that only has 300 milligrams of CBD, that bottle's gonna last you one in a third uh, days. That is not going to be cost effective. So what you're looking for is something that is um, less expensive per milligram. And the way you figure it out is you take how much you pay uh, for the bottle divided by the total milligram. So for instance, if you buy a bottle of CBD oil that's you know, one of the more um, kind of famous bottles, about $250 for 5,000 milligrams, it works out to a little more than five cents a milligram. If you were to purchase like a, a $60 bottle that has 200 milligrams in it, you know, you can do the math, you're going to be paying almost, you know, 40 cents a milligram, and that's not going to be very cost effective as you get into high doses. Um, we also want concentrated products. And what I mean by that is that we're in pediatrics, we use a one milliliter syringe, and it is kind of standard now uh, for many companies to say how many milligrams of CBD are in a one ml syringe. So let's say there's 10 milligrams in one ml versus 50 milligrams in one ml. If my child is taking 20 milligrams, it's only uh, going to be, let's see, like 0.2 mls of the 50, whereas my child would have to take two full mls of if it's the 10 milligram in one ml. So concentrated is better. And somewhere between 30 and 100 milligram per ml, I would consider concentrated. Now, moving on to THCA, um, as um, Dustin mentioned, low doses can be very effective with or without CBD. Often THCA, uh, we try sometimes in uh, patients who are on many uh, uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, I had a child who came to see me with a seven anti-seizure medications at once, still having 10 seizures a day. Obviously, those seven um, drugs were not uh, helping that much if he was having so many seizures daily. And uh, I did not feel comfortable adding in CBD because of the known drug interaction. So we started in him uh, on THCA. So uh, we have this, when I'm talking to patients, I have a discussion with them, or do you want to start with CBDA? I'm sorry, CBD, or do you want to start with THCA? And again, since low doses can be effective with THCA, sometimes families opt in for that because the cost if their child responds is much more reasonable for them to handle. Um, we start usually around 0.05 milligram per kilo per day and we increase in 0.1 milligram per kilo per day increments. I go up usually uh, uh, weekly. Again, every eight to 12 hour dosing, observing the child, seeing how they respond, uh, how long does this uh, medicine last in their body. Parental observations are crucial when treating uh, children. You can make no assumptions, you must get that feedback. Uh, there's no max dose described. I have patients on very low doses of THCA and I have patients on very high doses of THCA. I really don't see very many side effects. Um, they are, it can happen. I have seen some patients and again, uh, uh, it depends on the child. If they have both epilepsy and autism, sometimes we'll see uh, a different kind of side, side effect profile. Again, they they're, um, have uh, more neuro excitation. They may get agitated on this. They may have increased seizures. And then depending on the THC content, all THCA products, as far as I have seen, have a small amount of THC. Some even have a one-to-one -one ratio, which I don't normally recommend for epilepsy to start with. Um, but depending on the THC content, as you go up, you may see intoxication. Some children may be more um, uh, sensitive to this effect and some don't, it doesn't seem to bother them. So again, uh, you know, we customize dosing to fit the child. Again, in terms of products, you wanna check the COA, you wanna check the THC content. I prefer if I'm adding in THCA, a low uh, uh, THC content. Again, chemovar matters for some families, uh, for some patients. And I do recommend too that you keep your THCA bottle in a cool, dark place or keep it refrigerated as the longer it sits out. If you're in a home without air conditioning or it gets somehow sitting by a window and the sun comes in, uh, the THCA can convert to THC. And I have seen that where a patient, uh, a family bought a bottle and they decided to go in a different direction. And then they came back to the bottle six months later and that first dose was highly intoxicating to the child. So 
uh, again, um, you want to make sure you keep your products um, from uh, converting. For THC, um, I just yesterday a family shared with me that their neurologist told them THC causes seizures. Uh, as Dustin showed you, uh, in about 80% of the time, THC either uh, is anticonvulsant or has, or has a neutral effect. There are some uh, uh, cases where THC has caused seizures, but remember these are in animal studies in very, very high doses. As a clinician, I have in my career in the last 12 years had two patients, who uh, adult patients who did not have epilepsy, who overdosed on cannabis edibles, um, taking very high doses, like 180 milligrams all at once, out of the blue without any, um, you know, maybe a little tolerance, but not a lot of tolerance. And both of them did have uh, the first time ever tonic-clonic seizure requiring a visit to the hospital. And what's interesting is that, um, that both of those patients, again, were not um, THC naive, but they took a very large dose um, kind of out of the blue. I have not seen uh, THC really cause seizures in patients. And why is that? And it's because we're using very low doses. Again, we start low and go slow. This is under medical supervision. This isn't just some random eating a candy bar with a lot of THC. Um, I find low doses can be very effective. Um, I don't base it on weight, even though there are studies that show that you can do that. I usually start with somewhere between 0.25 or 0.5 milligrams. Again, it's sometimes hard to measure even less than that um, with some of the products that are available. I usually start every 8 to 12 hours, or sometimes we just add it in and on the morning dose so that the parent can observe their child to see if they're sensitive to it. And of course, we watch for the ceiling dose uh, which is the point at which uh, uh, someone becomes intoxicated. In palliative uh, care cases, uh, I don't um, uh, care too much if the patient is uh, getting intoxicated. Sometimes that is the point at which they're having relief and can actually have some quality of life. But with my patients with epilepsy and autism, I'm always trying to keep them below the intoxication level because uh, we are, want these kids to um, be able to learn and to go to school and to interact with their family. Um, and often parents who have not done this before will say, well, how do I know if my child's intoxicated? And parents know. They can see that their child is, is out of it a little bit. They get glazed over eyes. Maybe they're overly silly. Maybe they're giggling. Maybe they have munchies. Maybe they're super sedated. Any of those um, side effects that you see that should be discussed with the clinician and uh, the uh, dosing should be um, adjusted. Um, I like for products as opposed to CBD products where I like them more concentrated for THC, I like them less concentrated. So five milligram per ml or 10 milligram per ml allows for really low accurate dosing. Again, checking the COA and also the chemovar matters. So, uh, one thing I'd like to say is that if I do have a patient, let's say, trying one particular product of uh, THC, CBD, CBG, whatever it is, and we do not get the results that we're looking for, or we get results that we don't like, that it does not mean that the patient won't respond to another chemovar. It just may, it's, you can't say, oh, I ruled out THC because on the first product, the child didn't do well. So please always don't give up. You may just need to change the chemovar. Uh, because if you speak to any adult um, that is using cannabis for, you know, let's say, you know, PTSD or anxiety or chronic pain, they will tell you, for the most part, that the chemovar matters. Not every um, uh, plant will work for their condition. And for some people, it can take a lot of time. I remember being at a conference and a football player who was struggling with a number of um, conditions due to, you know, chronic head injury, uh, had said it took him six months to really find what worked. And think about that, six months, but not giving up. And that's a long time to search for your medicine. But he said that he had to because it was going to save his life because he had already tried all the medications and they actually made his, his life worse. Um, now, down here, I have a star at the bottom here for CBDA and CBG. Often we try these. There's no reason not to. We've definitely seen some benefits noted in epilepsy with CBDA and CBG. 
Again, it depends on the patient. I am just recently now inclined more to add CBDA to see if there is an anti-seizure um, uh, benefit as there are studies that show that it may be beneficial at low doses. And um, I'll be happy to report back after I have enough patients who have added it into their regimen. Now, in terms of drug interactions, and Dustin touched on this, so we have a similar slide. Uh, just to report, there's a couple of studies. As you can see, they're very recent, just in the last uh, couple of years. And really, the big, the two drugs that we uh, worry about mostly is clobazam and valproate. So this clobazam has the name Frisium or Onfi in this country, and valproate is Depakote, a uh, valproic acid, uh, Depakine. And again, the Issues are with clobazam. Remember, when you take clobazam, it is processed in the liver and it is converted to a secondary metabolite. And CBD appears to make the liver make more of that secondary compound in a way that can be beneficial. That secondary compound has anticonvulsant effects. That if if a person responds to that, that may help decrease seizures. But remember, too, that as that uh, secondary compound, that's N, here's the little um, uh, uh, name for it, n desmethylclobazam. when you make more of that, you can get more sedated. So there's the benefit of maybe um, you get a better anticonvulsant, but you also may, may see sedation. In one of the uh, main studies on Epidiolex, 40% of the uh, children that were in the trial who were on Onfi had to lower their Onfi dosing in order to stay in the trial because of the drug interaction between CBD and endosmethyl. And levels aren't usually drawn on this because clobazam and endosmethyl clobazam levels have not been shown to have a therapeutic range, but in an individual, it might be beneficial to get those levels before treatment, and then you can uh, draw levels again a month or two into treatment to see what's happening with those. But look, again, parents know their children. And when, if, as I'm going up on a CBD, uh, looking for the dose that is anticonvulsant, if a parent calls me and says, you know, we changed the CBD dose last week, my child's on Omphi, and now this week my child's really sedated, we're just going to assume that that interaction is happening. And we have to make a decision there is, are we gonna lower the Omphi or are we gonna lower uh, the CBD so that the child can have less sedation? And again, with valproate, it appears that there are increased uh, liver enzyme function tests on patients with valproate. Not all patients who were on valproate had this. And what's interesting in the second study, you can see that six patients out of, uh, I think it was 34, um, both valproate and CBD had elevated, elevated liver function tests. It was not permanent. Once either, either drug was either lowered or withdrawn, those tests uh, normalized. They recovered from that. And what's fascinating is they went back a little bit later and rechallenged with CBD without the valproate, and there was no elevated liver function test. Uh, Right now, there were, or just recently, there was a statement from the FDA saying CBD is uh, damaging to the liver. Um, uh, Dustin and I can both attest that we just have not seen that in our patients. And uh, Dr. Senato, who also was a co-author on the study that, uh, on the paper that Dustin and I put out, um, he was drawing levels on his patients out of Seattle Children's and he did not see any elevation of liver function tests in any of his patients, including those who are on very high doses of artisanal CBD. And I just put in the box here, questionable benefits with the combination of CBD and clobazam. In the initial Epidiolex trials, uh, they had noted this trend. If you were on clobazam and CBD was added when you came into the trial, it appeared that you uh, had uh, you were more likely to have uh, a better response, although that has come into question now, and I think it's still a question mark, and we'll only see this um, as we continue to review uh, and look at cases. Now, in terms of autism, again, history, physical review of uh, previous and current medications and supplements. Um, autism, uh, I just want to share, you know, um, another very difficult um, condition to treat. There really isn't, uh, aren't very many uh, pharmaceuticals. There are antipsychotics that are approved for the irritability for autism. And as we know, uh, these medications can have really significant side effects, including uh, growing breasts in young children. 
Um, hormone levels get out of whack. There's also uh, other very serious, I mean, I had a child who came in to see me, he was 11 years old and four months on uh, one of the approved drugs, he had doubled his weight from 70 pounds to 140 pounds in just four months. So these drugs can have really uh, severe and life-changing uh, negative side effects. And there definitely needs to be another option. And as you can see from the research, it's very, very promising. Um, if I'm going to use CBD as the first choice, and remember, there's no right or wrong here. In all of my patients with autism, I tell, every, I tell all the parents, we're going to try. We have lots of cannabinoids to choose from. I don't know which one may fit your child. I'm going to take that history and I'm going to review everything you can tell me, but then we're going to, and we're going to try to start with an educated guess, but sometimes it's the fourth product. Sometimes it's the fifth product. Sometimes it's the 10th product. And, um, Unfortunately, that is uh, how uh, cannabis medicine works. But remember, that's what we're doing with epilepsy drugs. And that's also what we're doing sometimes with some of these other uh, medicines that are being used for autism, whether they're approved for it or off-label. So remember, um, Dustin mentioned a wide therapeutic range. I have patients responding to low dose CBD, 10, 20 milligrams per dose or per day, and other patients requiring very high doses, 800 milligrams a day. Uh, with Remember uh, something about CBD I don't think has been mentioned yet. There's some evidence to show that uh, when CBD is started or the dose is adjusted upwards, it takes two to six days for that change in dosing to reflect in the bloodstream. So you don't want to necessarily say, oh, I gave it two days and I don't see anything. So I usually tell people, give it every four to seven days to kind of let those levels uh, balance out. And of course, if you're having a terrible response where your child's going crazy and bouncing off the walls, you know, contact the pr practitioner so you can make the change or at least have a plan in advance that if this happens, then we're going to change the dosing. I usually start with a high ratio CBD to THC ratio, like 20 to 1, 25 to 1, 30 to 1. If there's no SIB, is self injurious behavior, aggression, or rage, but if a patient uh, has uh, these particular behaviors and it's uh, really causing um, problems in the home, I will start with a lower ratio, four to one, two to one, one to one. Um, studies usually start around one milligram per kilo per day and increase, as you saw in one of the Israeli studies, they started with one milligram per kilo per day and went up to 10 milligram per kilo per day. I usually start somewhere around 10 to 25 milligrams of CBD and I increase in 10 to 25 milligram. Uh, per dose increments, depending on the response. Because CBD can, even though there are reports to help with sleep, um, remember CBD can be alerting in low doses. And if a family is reporting that sleep is good, that it is not a real problem at night, I don't want to disrupt that sleep pattern with a nighttime dose because I have done it. And I've had families call me and say, we're seeing nice behaviors, but we give that nighttime dose and my son's running around the house all night. So I, in the beginning, I start with morning and afternoon, explaining to the family that we are likely going to adjust dosing and we're going to adjust timing depending on the, uh, the patient's response. Now, it's not wrong to give a dose at night. You certainly can, but it is my preference in those families where they have, where sleep is good, um, that uh, they... Uh, try not to disrupt that. And I will share with you, I have so many families that come in who say, you know, that they, their child is up all night or catnaps two hours here and there and whatnot. With those patients, I often will uh, recommend a dose at night. Uh, THCA, again, low doses, often effective. There is no known max dose. You know, hundreds of milligrams of THCA have been taken with no uh, repercussions. Um, I usually start with one to two milligram per dose and I increase in one to two milligram increments again every four to seven days. If we are seeing a positive result, I tell parents, give it seven days. We want to know that this is actually having a consistent day to day effect. Um, anybody can have a good day or a bad day and we can't necessarily say it is the oil or not. So that is why observation over a period of time is very important. And again, with THCA, every eight to 12 hours to start. Um, I do have some patients on four times a day, but those are a very specific kind of, you know, we've been in treatment for a while and we figure out that that's what worked. 
Um, I find THC to be very effective for focus, rage, aggression, self-injurious behavior, and sleep. Obviously, parents are reporting these uh, benefits. Uh, starting dose between 1 and 2.5 milligrams and increasing in 1 to 2.5 milligram increments. And um, when you're using a product that is uh, not very concentrated, you can even get, uh, you know, 1.5 milligram dose or, um, you know, uh, so we can go 1, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, 3 3.5, and titrate up in very tiny increments. Uh, depending on uh, what's going on with the patient. And again, watch for ceiling dose and tolerance. The interesting thing about tolerance is that it's pretty clear that low dosing under somewhere I'd say 10 to 15 milligrams a day doesn't appear to cause very much tolerance. The patients stay responsive. Once you start getting into the higher doses, it does appear that uh, tolerance uh, can develop. I have found clinically that when CBD is in the regimen, uh, often uh, the tolerance uh, does not seem to build as quickly. And in some of those patients, they just don't seem to get tolerance as well, even if they're on a little bit of a higher dose. Uh, CBDA, in my experience, we've seen some patients have um, uh, some benefits for behavior. Specifically, impulsivity is something that seems to be uh, responding in some patients, not all, and then some sensory issues as well. Uh, for some of those patients who are really sensory seeking, the parents have reported that when they added CBDA in, the, the, the behaviors have lessened. Again, starting low dose, one to two milligram uh, uh, per dose, and then increasing in very uh, low increments. Uh, again, no known maximum dose. I have not seen any negative side effects with CBDA except for two patients, or parents, I should say, who reported that they felt their child was intoxicated. And at that point, I was more concerned about what was in the bottle than, than I was with the child's response. Obviously, we stopped it and switched to a different product, but it may have been a mislabeled product. Again, uh, those two families um, were both families who I recall purchased um, online and not through a dispensary. And then CBG, uh, the biggest um, uh, benefit that I've seen is anxiety and mood. Uh, CBG has been shown to be an antidepressant and anti-anxiety, uh, and parents have reported this. We have seen some benefit in speech, focus, and behaviors as well with CBG, again, depending on the patient. And again, I start low, one to two milligrams per dose, and we increase. I know of patients who take, I know I'm starting very low here, remember I'm working with mostly young children, but I have some patients who are on 40 milligrams a day of CBG. Once we start to see, if I don't see anything in that first you know, few weeks where we're tiptoeing up, then I start to go up in bigger increments as long as I know um, that the family is you know, able to contact me and let me know what's going on. Again, no max dose. It appears with CBG um, that for some patients, much higher doses are needed. And then I will tell you, I have some patients who are exquisitely sensitive to one or two milligrams. I have found CBG to be somewhat alerting in low doses. So I usually recommend a morning dose only. I've had a number of families who were doing a dose in the morning and a dose in the late afternoon. And remember, for many children, they go to bed early, somewhere seven, seven eight, nine uh, o'clock at night. And so a dose given at four or 5 p.m., it may affect that sleep and can be alerting. So usually in the beginning, I start just in the morning. We want to see what the dosing does. Where do we go with the dosing? How does the child respond? And then we adjust as needed. Now I'm going to just go through a few case reports. So um, some of you who are here may actually recognize this patient. Um, she's adorable. She's now 16 years old. She came to me when she was 10 years old, intractable epilepsy due to a congenital disorder. And she um, was having hundreds of seizures a day on her EEG. She was markedly developmental delay, really um, not making progress at all. And she had tried eight different medications. She came in on one medication as the family said, you know, we're not going to continue to give her medication that doesn't work. Now, what's interesting is at the time that she came to me, remember this is six years ago, uh, we didn't have a lot of products that I showed you. Not all of those were on the market, but we started with a high ratio CBD. And what the parents reported was that she became alert. She became attentive. She started tracking the mom and dad, looking at them with her eyes, but there was no change in the seizures as far as the parents could tell. And after um, 
dialing up on the dose, we decided at that point we were going to add in THC to see if that helped. And that is when she had significant reduction of seizures. And then after that, what we saw was improvement in what she was able to do, her engagement, her ability to interact with her family, her ability to uh, progress in therapy just took off after those seizures uh, were reduced. At that point, we added in some THCA because that became available and she had further reduction of seizures. And as you can see, um, in that first year, she had over a 90% reduction of seizures. Uh, and uh, her last tonic-clonic seizure was two years ago. She had an EEG that showed, uh, I think it was a 48-hour EEG, showed no seizures at all. And now developmentally, she's amazing. She's feeding herself. Her mom sent, uh, uh, sent me a video of her using a spoon to feed herself. This was something that when she was 10 years old before cannabis, she, they were told she's never going to do any of these things that she's doing now. Using a sippy cup on her own, playing games on the iPad, sitting unassisted, uh, reported uh, parents say that she clearly understands what, uh, uh, what they're saying to her. And then her mom sent me a absolute tear jerking, but wonderful video of her saying mama for the first time when she was 12 years old. Um, here's a, another case report. I just want to say we should probably get okay. two questions in just a few minutes. Okay, I'm winding up. So this is um, another report here of a young man who um, uh, has autism with severe aggression, nonverbal. They had tried over 20 cannabis products with no success, but they had never tried high-dose CBD. And within one day of trying 300 milligrams a day, he, he completely changed everything for him. Um, and this is the email I got from the family. School is great, everything pleasant, no complaints. Uh, this is just another report of a child with um, autism. And I just want to point out that this child was completely overstimulated on both low doses, high doses of CBD, also low ratios. This was on high ratio CBD. Low ratio CBD didn't help. THCA was the key for this child. And look, low dose, six milligrams in the morning and after school with a, a very good response. And then if you just bear with me, two, uh, just three more slides. So biphasic nature, what does that mean? Low doses do one thing, high doses can do complete opposite. If low doses don't work or give a negative response, I always tell people you must try medium and high doses. Don't give up because you can get the opposite response. And again, in especially children with autism, if low doses are overstimulating, which they can be, remember higher doses can be calming. Uh, again, we talked about drug-drug interactions, bioavailability. By the way, when you take 100 milligrams of CBD, that's not necessarily what you're getting into your bloodstream. Bioavailability is low. Sublingual, this is through um, GI orally. Sublingual, somewhat better in inhalation is definitely better. There are some families that are using inhalation uh, when a child is having a rage or severe aggression. So that is an option for some families. And then just last slide, start low, go slow. One medication at a, at a change at a time so you know what's causing what. Try different cannabinoids singly and then in combination. Uh, rule it in or rule it out. That's the only way to do it. Try to be methodical. And then managing expectations. This is going to take time. There is no, uh, there are some patients who respond immediately, but you know, when you talk to families, you'll see that it, it is an overtime response. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldstein. That was also, that was amazing. Um, and so many people have been asking about these presentations and asking if we're gonna have them on our website. And I do wanna say we will have them on our website, uh, safeaccessnow.org under uh, the news tab and then ACE Alive. We will have the whole presentation uh, for you available probably starting next week. Uh, we have a lot of questions, and so if we don't get to them all, I promise you we will send the questions to Dr. Sulak and Dr. Goldstein, and also one, some of your amazing comments that you've been giving today as well, so we'll make sure that we'll send them to them. So the first question is, is autism defined as a clinical endocannabinoid deficiency? This could be for either of you. Sure. Well, just, yeah, well, oh, go, go ahead, ahead Bonnie. Go ahead, Dustin. No, no, oh, okay. I'm curious. Well, I was just going to say, I define it that way. There's some evidence that the uh, uh, people who have autism have uh, low levels of endocannabinoids. There's only a handful of studies, and so some might say that that doesn't make a diagnosis. But 
when I combine that with my clinical findings. You know, this isn't magic medicine. Where does it work? We look at where cannabinoids work and uh, in, in uh, augmenting the endocannabinoid system seems to benefit many people with this diagnosis. So I would say yes. Yeah, I would just add that autism is usually a constellation of a lot of things happening. It's, you know, I don't think we can attribute it to a single factor, but it looks like endocannabinoid dysfunction is a big part of that for a lot of the patients that have it. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any specific conditions or situations that you would want to use uh, CBDA over CBD? Sure. Well, I could comment on that. I mean, I think if someone's responding well to CBD, I wouldn't necessarily change that. But if they're not having a great response to CBD or a partial response, adding CBDA might make it more powerful. Another um, example would be in so CBD and THC have this interaction and it's usually useful clinically where CBD kind of turns down the activity of THC at the CB1 receptor that, that usually makes the THC more tolerable. So less psychoactive side effects, maybe less cardiovascular side effects, uh, usually a benefit for patients, sometimes not. Sometimes CBD can interfere with some of the activity of THC because in the presence of CBD, THC doesn't exert its full effect. I think that would be one situation where I would uh, more strongly consider CBDA because it doesn't seem like CBDA has the same effect on the CB1 receptor. So while it mimics CBD at many other targets like the GPR55 and trip V1 receptor and so forth, it doesn't seem like it has the same property as CBD on the CB1 receptor. So if, if you're really trying to get the full power of THC, maybe um, maybe not the CBDA, uh, excuse me, maybe not C, maybe use CBDA instead of CBD. And then also it looks like CBDA may be more potent. And so if somebody's struggling with the cost of CBD, it might be worth trying to potentiate that with some CBDA. Anything else, Bonnie, that you would suggest? No, I wouldn't add. It's perfect. I wouldn't add anything. Um, okay, we have a lot of kind of dosage questions and um, and um, questions about uh, which cannabinoids to start with. Um, when starting a young child on cannabis for seizures, do you recommend starting with one dominant cannabinoid at a time or a ratio? And do you, and to follow that up, do you tend to start with CBD or THC first? So I can take that question. I tend to start with high ratio CBD. Remember, you don't want only, I don't, and I recommend, you don't want CBD isolate with no THC. That THC in there is beneficial. You want to have some THC present in the product. But when we're talking about high ratio, what we're talking about is like, let's say 20 parts CBD to one part THC. That is a, what we call mono dominant compound. It's mostly CBD. There's a little bit of THC in there, but when you are giving this to a patient, can we say that it's the CBD? Let's say a patient responds with low seizures or less seizures. You can't say necessarily it is the CBD. It's, it's kind of the whole picture. It's the whole plant. Um, and again, there's no right or wrong way to do this. There are some you know, kind of clinical tips. If someone is on a lot of medication, I might not start with a high ratio CBD. I actually might start with THCA if that's available. Um, for that patient. But at the same time, when you start, if I, th there is a company here in California that has a, com a combination of CBD and THCA. I normally don't start with that because I don't know what the child's responding to. And I kind of want to know at the end of six months, I want to know how a child responds to the various different cannabinoids. So for me, I prefer to start with a mono dominant high ratio CBD to THC, um, uh, product for epilepsy. Yeah, I would say the same thing. It's nice to know what's working and what's not working. I usually make the choice between starting with CBD, THC, or THCA, depending on the comorbidities. And what I might be more interested in seeing is potential side benefits. So someone with a lot of GI distress and pain and trouble sleeping and hyperactivity, uh, adding THC may help, uh, or starting with a THC trial may be more helpful because 
we might be addressing the primary symptoms like seizures, but we're also, or, or autistic spectrum for that matter, uh, but we might also see better sleep. And of course, sleep is a huge factor in seizure threshold. Um, we might see better nutrition, better behavior, better interaction with the family. So it, it's kind of a, that uh, individualized approach. Okay, we have another question. Um, do you feel that se the seizure rescue medication diazepam um, eff efficacy can be neutralized with a patient's regular use of CBD or THC? I wouldn't expect that, and I don't think I've seen that. Diazepam would likely be potentiated by THC, not reduced. Well, what are your thoughts, Bonnie? Same. I have not seen that myself. question. Okay. Um, if you get some effect with CBD um, and hit a max without an effect on aggression, um, when you start THC, should you reduce the CBD? So my approach is always when you add something in, you leave everything else the same because then you know, okay, this is the baseline where I'm at with these compounds. I'm adding this in, and now I can see what effect this has. So I really recommend one change at a time. It gets very muddy. If you lower CBD and add THC on the same day and things go completely awry, you have no idea why. So I try to just do one change at a time. Um, we have a question from a mother of a patient. Uh, her son is on a special formulated CBD and CBG hemp oil, um, and he has spasticity um, and tone. His neurologist wants him to take Valium uh, Diastat for muscle spasms. Um, and many parents are telling her not to give him the Valium. Uh, they want to know if you know anything about that. Sure. I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm happy to comment. So, um, you know, I think that uh, CBD does have some antispastic properties. They're not nearly as impressive as those of THC. And what's really beautiful about THC is it tends to lower the tone in the areas of the body that are hypertonic, that, that have increased muscle tone, but it doesn't make the normal tone areas less have less tone. And I've actually had one patient in particular who had really mac, uh, a mixed spasticity in the limbs and hypotonia in the trunk. And using THC in that patient uh, improved both almost completely. Uh, so I think if you're looking for the alternative or, or something that's safer than Valium, uh, likely less habit forming, doesn't produce respiratory suppression. Uh, in this case, I would give THC a try if it were my patient before trying Valium. Um, have this is a question for either of you. Have you seen diarrhea or GI distress um, with any of your patients who are using CBD products cut with MCT oil? Well, I've seen not very many patients have GI distress or diarrhea, although a, a small number, a very, I would, like I said, a less than 10% of patients, I think maybe even less than 5%. Um, and I wouldn't say specifically with MCT oil. I think um, each child is, or each patient is an individual. And so it might just be from oil in general, or it may be to a specific oil. I would add that, you know, Bonnie was really emphasizing um, getting your CBD in a higher potency. So you have to deliver less volume of oil, whatever the carrier oil is. Like if any of us listening today took enough oil in a single serving with or without a meal, it would have a laxative effect. If, if we consume more oil than we're able to absorb in our small intestine, and, and there's a lot of factors there with enzymes and bile production and so forth, then that oil becomes a laxative. So it may just be the quantity of oil or an individual sensitivity to a certain type of oil. Um, okay, we have a, a question. This is a good question because a lot of our, uh, a lot of people live in uh, areas with limited products. And so this is a question about when you live in a location with a uh, limited availability of products, where do you recommend starting um, 
with a patient for autism in terms of formulations. Um, and she says specific to THC products found in dispensaries. You want to take a, that? Yeah. Well, um, I, it, it's hard to know. You know, sometimes when I uh, treat patients that have very little access, and I'm sure that I, what I want is THC, I'll actually use the pharmaceutical preparation, dronabinol. I don't, it, it's hard to answer this question because I don't know exactly how limited the access is. It sounds like there is some THC that's available. And even if there is some, you can certainly make your own product. If it's just flour that you have access to, maybe that's what the question is about. Plenty of recipes for making your own product and hopefully being able to get that tested by a lab so you know the potency. But that's how I think Bonnie and I had practiced for a long time before you know these infused oils with specific uh, potencies were available in the marketplace. Moms and dads were making their own. So maybe that helps answer it. Um, what is the half-life of CBD, or is there one? Yeah, I think studies have shown somewhere in like the 12 to 24 hour range. I think maybe the most recent was uh, 15 hours, it, and I'm sure it varies by individual. But usually a steady state, I think that question is probably, uh, the, the real question is when do we see a steady state after dose change? Meaning after you increase the dose, how many days until you feel like that blood level has kind of reached its equilibrium? And that's probably three to five for CBD. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on adding CBN for sleep for a six-year-old? Can I answer that one? This is one That's of the things that sticks in my craw. You go there for it. Zero research, zero, that supports CBN for sleep. So it's one of these things that got posted somewhere on the internet, and now it's just been propagated over and over, and now there's products that say CBN for sleep. They're, all the studies that have been done in humans show that there is no sedative effect. Low doses, they've given 200 milligrams to adult human volunteers who felt no sedative. Now remember, when you're talking about cannabis, you're talking about a product that has multiple compounds. So if you take, remember what is CBN? Cannabinol, it's the breakdown product of THC. If I harvest a plant, I, there's very little trace amounts of CBN. If I let that product, let's say let that flower lay around for a while, THC starts to degrade and it changes to CBN. And so remember though, that it's not the only uh, compound in the product that's aging. Some of the terpenes are aging. And so what we think is it potentially, and again, again, more research would be helpful. And I think a nice you know, uh, study that would define this for everybody so we have some clarity, but potentially what's happening is the more alerting terpenes are degrading, leaving the more sedating terpenes behind. And maybe someone might say, oh yeah, I took some CBN and I feel sleepy. But as far as studies show right now, there is no evidence that CBN is um, sedating. I agree with that. And I have concerns about how the CBN is produced because the exposure to that much heat and oxidation could potentially create some toxic compounds uh, as well. So no, I, I wouldn't suggest that. Okay, we probably have time for about maybe two more questions. Um, this is a good one. Someone asked us this um, about a week ago, so I'm interested to see what you guys think. Um, is there any input on the benefit of juicing organic fresh cannabis and hemp? Do you guys know anything about juicing? Well, I think it's a great idea for people that are looking at kind of like a tonic or a dietary supplement. You know, when we're treating conditions like ASD and epilepsy and other neurologic conditions, we want a, a steady dose that we know what it is. It's not just here, take a shot of juice. Um, and, and what we see sometimes with the acidic cannabinoids is that when the really low doses work, higher doses don't work. So you might just be blowing past that therapeutic window uh, without even knowing it. So I, I think if you've got a lot of cannabis around, you want to juice it or throw the leaves in your smoothie, uh, that's great. I, I would encourage the parents to do that. But in the uh, patients, we want to be more precise. Anything to add, Dr. Goldstein? Or? No, I agree. I have, I, the one population where I've seen patients have um, good results are people who have chronic pain. It seems that if they juice even a small amount, it does seem 
that they do get some benefits. And I'm sure a lot of it has to do with the anti-inflammatory effects of, of the raw compounds. That's great, thank you. Okay, we'll do one more question. And like I said, if we didn't get to your questions today, I'm sorry, because there are a few more. We will make sure that Dr. Sulak and Dr. Goldstein get your questions and also your, the amazing comments that you guys have been sending. Um, when titrating to find appropriate dose for seizures, um, if the dose is too low and causing an increase in seizures, at what point do you decide to stop increasing dose and try another cannabinoid? So I think the question is, is if you're seeing, you're titrating up and you're seeing increased seizures as you go up. So, you know, it just depends on where the level is. So if I still think they're on the low end of the therapeutic range, I would probably just kind of jump up a little more just to rule it in or rule it out that a high dose works or doesn't work. And then I might switch over to another cannabinoid. If a patient starts uh, with a high ratio CBD, let's say, and we get through about, um, you know, halfway or two thirds through that therapeutic range and there's been no effect whatsoever, again, I will jump up again, rule it in or rule it out. But also you have to remember, it may just be that particular chemovar does not fit that particular person's chemistry. And you might want to try not necessarily jumping to another cannabinoid. And again, it depends on the case. If it's a child having lots of seizures, I might jump to another cannabinoid. So could be kind of, we look at it as we don't have a lot of time to start exploring with CBD all over again. CBD is the compound I find that takes the longest to figure out. The other cannabinoids, because often they're effective in lower doses, you can, and they have, you know, they do have a wide range for some of them, but at the same time, I, I definitely feel like CBD is the one that takes the longest to figure out. I hope that answers the question. I don't know if you have anything to add, Dustin. No, that answers it from my perspective. Okay, well, thank you guys so much. I mean, your presentations are so amazing um, and we really appreciate it. And um, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, a lot of people have been asking, uh, you know, to get copies of your presentations. So like I mentioned, we will have it on our website under the news tab, ACE Alive. This webinar will be available next week. Um, and now we are gonna do, we have a brief, little break. Uh, we have a patient testimonial coming up. Um, and then we're going to start our next session, Pediatric Cannabis Champions in the Community, in about eight minutes. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Debbie. A pleasure to be here today. Great to see you, Bonnie. Thanks, everybody. I began using medical cannabis in 2013 when I was seven for bone tumors and my epilepsy, which started soon after I was diagnosed. The treatment options we were given had a lot of bad side effects like chemotherapy, so my mom decided to try cannabis. Cannabis has been my only medicine for my bone tumors. I'm in remission and my seizures are managed. My medical team is amazed by how well my bones have regenerated and that my tumors are gone. Cannabis has helped me be able to live a normal life and it has helped me reach my full potential. I've been using it for seven years and I'm a straight A honor student. I know I would not be doing this well if it hadn't been for cannabis. You never know if you or a loved one will need this medicine. Please support making medical cannabis a priority in Congress. Many lives are lost due to lack of legal access. Go to safeaccessnow.org slash vote. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm.